Hi. <laughs> Hi, Amanda. How are you, Susie? Great so far. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, I guess I just wanted to talk to you today and find out about how you look after animals that you find on the roads. Okay. Um, I'm part of a network of about a thousand people that Bonnerong and the Parks and Wildlife Department kind of coordinate. Some of them transport animals around from one carer, you know, from who finds them to the carers. Some people are carers and there's um, email, a text to go out every day with the animals that need to go into care and people respond, usually if they're close by. Um, there's also the animals you find yourself if you keep checking pouches. And there's also, because I, I work in a school, I have that huge network of parents and kids who bring things as well. So there's a pretty constant stream, but there's p pulses of when they come in. So at the moment, it's um, Bennett's Joey season, and there's a lot of Bennett's Joeys coming in on the network, and I've got one. I had two, but one didn't make it. Mm. <sighs> but... Um, That's heaps more information that I, I didn't know all of that. I didn't know that there was a network. Um, I really did think it was more localised and more individual, so I did think it was people that found animals um, in our local area rather than being more of a statewide um, system that's set up. So I think that's yeah, great. That it's really good. But it used to be very localised mm -hmm. um, with Parks and Wildlife just having a list of people in different localities, but now Bonnerong have a list and they text out to everybody all the time. Um, and they, they do training courses for different things. They do training courses for people who are going to be first response people who are going to go to, to the road, pick up the joey out of the pouch and bring it in. And, and then they've got training for people who want to be carers. Okay. And carers get mentored by okay. a more experienced carer. Yeah. You start with a bigish, robust joey and you kind of work your way backwards as you get more experience. Okay, so what kind of age are you nursing at the moment um this joey he's just he's called a velvet he's gone from pink in the last couple of weeks to just starting to get his fur so he's got tiny fur on his body he's a bennett's and so he's gray and um he's about four or five and four and a half to five months old and when did you get him then i got him three weeks ago okay and someone brought him to you or you found him um he was on the network somebody <laughs> found him in conningham yeah and got onto the network and the network said oh we need someone in kingston and um and they nobody was responding and they said oh we're getting desperate about this one and so i'm only 45 minutes drive from so i said oh well i'll go so i went up and picked him up from the person who found him mm -hmm. And um, and then the, that same day, they they had another one that a woman brought. And I said, oh, look, I'll take it because having two is better than having one. Okay. Why uh, would that be? Just because they have each other okay. for company. Yep. And body contact. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he when he came, he had a broken foot and a, and a dislocated wrist and possibly internal injuries as well. I don't know. Wow. Okay. So he got, he could have been damaged in the in, in, in the, the car impact. accident. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, and does that happen a lot? Like, are they, like, I guess when a car is hitting an animal, um, the mother is the one that is having the huge amount of impact. So is the baby protected in the pouch most of the time? Most of the time, yeah. Um, look, if the, if the animal gets run over in its body or impacted in its body, then the baby's quite often killed. Okay. Um, I found one the other day where the baby had actually been torn up in the pouch. Wow, mm. okay. Um, but if the mother is hit in the head, mm -hmm. then the pouch is, is fine. Mm -hmm. And the baby will be fine and it will go sometimes all night. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a miracle that babies can be alive, I guess. Um, the, the, quick, the sooner after the impact and the, the death of the mother, the sooner that you come across them and can get them into care and keep them warm and keep them hydrated, mm -hmm. the better their chance of survival. And how are you hydrating them? What do you need to do? Um, you can orally hydrate them just with a little tiny teat, some um, boiled water and um, electrolyte replacer. Okay. And just keeping that 
into them for, uh, you know, 12 or 24 hours, depending on how high dehydrated they are. If they've been all night and somebody picks them up at 11 o'clock the next day, or they usually come to you really cold and very dehydrated. Okay. And then um, there's different schools of thought. Some people insist on oral hydration. Some people um, use a subcutaneous injection of a Hartman's solution. It's like a body fluid. Mm -hmm. And if you inject that in um, just under the skin, mm -hmm. their bodies will absorb that okay. really quickly. Yeah. And that just helps all their internal organs to keep functioning because dehydration is the thing that kills most of them. Okay. So it's important if we, like I am someone that doesn't know how to care <laughs> for one of these beautiful animals. Um, so for me, what would I do? If I came across a joey and it was within that time frame, I would then be just um, orally... Yeah, if you could get some drops of water, yeah, warm water, just boiled and cooled okay. water, just drop it in. Okay. In a with a eyedropper, just you know this little crack that runs down there. It must it's it works beautifully for when an animal is grazing wet grass. The water is going in. Mm -hmm. It's collecting water. So if you just drop water on that little crack, it'll direct it into their mouth, and they'll lick it and swallow it. Wow, that's so amazing. So if you've got time to keep doing that for a few minutes, yeah. you can get enough water in them to keep them hydrated. Mm. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then keep them warm. Mm. And then, so how many animals do you think you have rescued? I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> it's been since 1990. Yeah. I've, I just, between one and five a year, so. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Yep. More than 50? Yeah, wow. Probably less than 100. Okay, that's a lot of animals. It's a lot of babies. Yeah. And do they survive when you let them go back into the wild or is that a hard integration? Um, I'm really lucky here because I can do what's called a soft release and that means they can gradually integrate themselves into the populations of the wild animals that are, that are out there already. Mm -hmm. So the paddy melons seem to integrate quite easily. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of, I mean, there's different schools. There's so there's many schools of thought on how to bring up wildlife as there is about how to bring up actual human children. Okay. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I, I, a lot of people will say oh, I'm completely wrong, but it's this works for me that um, when they when they start wanting to go out, we go out together mm -hmm. and they follow me around, and then when I run out of time, I come in, and if they don't want to come in, they can stay out. Okay. And um, at the moment, I've got three little paddy melons ranging in size to, from two kilos down to uh, 1.2 kilos. And they just go out in the daytime and they wouldn't want to stay in. Yeah. But at night when I get home, I call them in and the two smaller ones come in. Yeah. The big one won't come in at night. She's She poo-poos that unless the weather's really foul <laughs> and then she's in. in. And um, they sleep in bed. Okay. With me. Yeah. They love it. They cuddle up and they're just so happy yeah. cuddled up and they drink a bottle before they go to sleep and Aww. they eat food and then we all cuddle up together and in the morning they have another bottle and out they go. They rush out. Yeah. Um, except this morning, because it's the weekend, the big one came in this morning at six and she had some food and had a bottle and then she got into bed too and I woke up at <laughs> nine o'clock. <laughs> The bed was littered with wallabies, and, <laughs> and it was, and it's beautiful. There's something amazing about having an animal that's wild, yeah, that chooses to be with you. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm. Um, and so they just, and a lot of, uh, a lot of the um, current school of thinking is that you shouldn't uh, customize them to humans mm -hmm. because they become Depen dependent, dependent and domesticated yep. and stuff. But yeah. In my experience, they, they're they just like human babies in that they are very dependent and they want to be in contact with you and they and they kind of fight to have the best spot next to you. So, <laughs> and there'll be little, little rows and lots of swearing. It's like you're in my spot. No, that's my spot. You, you know, it's my spot. You always have that. You know, it's like children. Yeah, that's so great. <laughs> but then, um, then they get to a kind of teenagerhood and they go, don't talk to me, man. I'm no, no, I'm not coming in the house. <laughs> don't talk to me. People are watching and and then after they get through that and then they will come in. Um, I find a lot of the little girl ones will come in the day that they've first um, had intercourse. Okay. So they come in a bit upset and okay. they want to be cuddled Aww. and um, and reassured. Wow. It must be a little bit confronting. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> and I know that it's that because they'll be cuddled and reassured and they'll get up and there'll be a little puddle of semen where they've been sitting. No. Oh. <laughs> oh. How um, traumatic. It is a little bit. It's like, I, didn't, I wasn't expecting that. But I have to say, Paddy Mill and men, yeah. I don't know what the actual act is like, but they do quite a lot of very nice romancing and dating and foreplay and, and stroking and whispering and touching the girls' faces. Yeah. And, and it's not like they just grab them and shag them. Yeah, it's not. It's like, really lovely. Yeah, brutal. Mm. Yeah. Possums, on the other hand, I don't know this. It's there whenever there are whenever the males come traveling through. Mm. There's so much screaming and bad language. Yes, I don't. Yeah. I don't really know. I don't know what they're saying. No, I've never been sure about um, that either. Yeah, I think, but I reckon male possums have to tread really carefully. Okay, yeah. okay, they're actually getting in trouble, are they? I don't know, <laughs> but it doesn't sound good. No, it doesn't. Does it? Um. I haven't had possums for a while because my house isn't possum proof anymore. Mm. But in um in the nineties and the first decade of this, um, I could have possums in the house because mm-hmm. everything that could possibly be smashed had already been smashed by okay. possums. Wow! And so yep. you get to the vacuum and you go, oh well, it's safe now. Nothing else can get wrecked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they're quite damaging. They're... Well, they just operate in three D. Yeah. Like, there's nowhere they can't go. They just you know walk up the walls and up the curtains and stuff like that, and they're adorable. Yeah. And and the same, they just really they become so upset if they're not being cuddled and nursed to you. And if you leave them to go and have a shower, they cry like disconsolate children. It's so sad. <laughs> and then um, they grow up, and the whole outside world and the sort of busy commerce up on the hillside of whatever goes on, yeah. it's too alluring and so they just really want to go out. Yeah. And um, you just accommodate them. So they'll rock in about 3 o'clock in the morning and bang on the door and you just have to get up and let them in and then they all rush in. And I've got a log and all of the little possums would tumble into the log and they'd oh. be <coughs> bad language about, you know, <laughs> your, your foot's in my face. That's my spot. No, you always have that spot, you know. <laughs> And then um, some happy sighs and off to sleep. Yo. Um, but whatever happens, mm. it would have been better if all these babies had been in their own mother's pouches. Yeah. Yep, it would. Um, so it's hard going. Like mm. You wouldn't take on looking after a, um, a joey if you couldn't actually take on looking after a baby. Yes, okay. Yeah, so it's all all the time. It's all the time. Yeah. And, um, yeah, day and night. Yeah. All the time. So the Joey that you have with you now has to go to school with you. He goes to school tucked inside my shirt. Yep. The kids, I've been doing this for so long that the kids are all really blasé now. Yeah. They don't care. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, you know, they kind of go, oh, isn't it cute? But they don't really want to see it anymore and they've learned they can't pat and they've learned to keep quiet around them and... So it's a great learning thing for the kids. Yes, yeah. And the joeys seem to um, adapt. Mm-hmm. And to, to and then, like, to just, the environment. Yeah, and the yep. routine. And okay. I've got time at school to, like, take them out where it's warm and quietly feed them in the library where it's quiet. Yeah. And, um, and then as they get too big, then they, they start to stay home. Okay. Yeah, and they're okay for a day while you're out, or are they just outside? Um, when they're little, bit in that transition period, they just stay okay. in their in their pouch. Yeah, I'm only gone for seven or eight hours, so okay. They um, they stay in their pouch, or they kind of potter around the house if they're a bit bigger. Mm. And there's food, and you know, and I have a big furry brown bean bag that they can get into <laughs> if they like. They love it. <laughs> oh, so great. Yeah, and then they make the slow transition, you know, out for 15 minutes, out for 20 minutes, out for an hour, out for a couple of hours. The first time they stay out overnight, I just lie in bed worrying. <laughs> but And then in the morning they come in there enthusiastic for food. Okay, yeah. But, you know, they, so what are you worrying for? I'm like, just worried that an hour will take them if, okay. they're, if they're too small. Or yep. There's some devils nearby yep. under the, in that. Um, she has babies and I just think, oh, I don't know whether devils would chase down a little wallaby, but maybe if they were hungry enough, they might. Okay, yeah. And um, I've had other animals as well, bandicoots and potteroos. And um, I get 
I get animals that, you know, that nobody knows what's happened to them. People just ring up and say, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a sick looking quoll under our car in the garage. Mm. And, um, you just do what you can for animals like that. You, um, if I can take them to the vet. Okay. I do. Yeah. There's one fantastic vet in Sandy Bay. Mm-hmm. Um, both of the vets there are um, very good with wildlife. Yeah. But you can't just go to any vet. They're just not tra- – they'll, they'll tell you themselves they don't have training in wildlife. Okay. Yeah, so you need to find one that – That has – That can. Okay. Gets it. Yeah. Um, we were on our way to your house once. I don't actually think you even know that. But <laughs> we were driving – it must have been probably four years ago – and we're driving along and I think we came across an animal or it had been hit while we had been driving. It was one of those, not sure what had happened, but I do remember there was there was two cars There was like, and we were both friends and we were both going in the same direction. We all had our kids in the car and they were really sad that we had come across this um, like sore paddy melon or like hurt paddy melon. So we ended up getting out of the car and... and nurturing him and we weren't sure where, what to do so I think we raced over to your house and you weren't home um, but by the time we ended up going back home he'd passed so there was something that I had heard once about shock that the animals get shocked really easily because they've got a weak heart so is there like are they also getting hurt by not even getting hit by a car like are they getting hurt by being frightened are we coming across animals and we're swerving out of their way um no I don't I don't think that would do it okay um paddy melons in the past would have been um hunted by thylacines Mm -hmm. and the thylacines would have just trotted they didn't have to run them down they just trot along kind of cantering along behind them and the paddy melons would run and run and run and run yep and then um the cortisol builds up in their blood and then they just pass out from exhaustion and or have a heart attack. Okay. I think I think that's and um, and that's how thylacines hunted. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no thylacines now. Yeah. But I know that when animals come to me with a broken leg, people bring me things that are smashed. Okay. Um, they die. Yes. I guess from just the shock of the injury and the shock of being transported. Yep. I guess that. The best thing with an animal with a broken leg is to just hit it on the head on the side of the road. Okay, so that's the kindest thing. That I think we can it's do. the kindest thing because it's probably going to, well, it is going to die anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and hitting it on the head on the side of the road is might be the kindest thing, but um, some people can't do it. I have um, been in that situation before. Um, I am a vegetarian, so I'm not very good with <laughs> killing animals. So my friend had to try and do it for us. And she wasn't successful. She tried a couple of times and that didn't actually work. So it was a very... It's traumatic. Traumatic experience for us and for them. Um, So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's part of the tragedy that people don't Mm. get, that there's animals that aren't killed, Yep. that are you know, have a broken leg or an injured spine and they can't really move or they can drag themselves off the road into the bush mm-hmm. and then they lie there and gradually die mm-hmm. and are gradually eaten by maggots. Some people bring me things that are already covered in fly eggs. Well, okay. And I just think, God, if the person hadn't picked them up when they had, these would have all hatched and the animal would have been eaten alive. Because, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so really tragic things can happen. Really tragic things. And, of course, the ravens are going to jump in. And, like, ravens, they're not, you know, nature isn't um, humanitarian enough to go, oh, the paddy melon's not dead yet. Oh, I won't start picking at its <laughs> eyes. I yeah. So what can we do? Like, because I've always seen ravens eating roadkill on the road. Like, that just is always, but it's always in the day. So that's when I'm driving. It's not usually at night. Um, so what's the best thing that we can do? Like, I know that working um, around the fact that dawn and dusk is the times that they're out the most. 
So to be conscious of that and be slower in our speed. Yeah, it would be really nice if people were slower. But even people who drive slowly, I become their confessor and they tell me, you know, they see me in the supermarket and they say, oh, I feel so bad, you know, I was going only 40 kilometres an hour but this thing just jumped straight in front of my car and I couldn't miss it and I didn't know what to do. And, you know, I can't swerve, I couldn't swerve, I had the kids in the car. Mm. Um. I don't know what, what, what can we do. I mean, we could all stop driving at night. In I know in Alice Springs, they very um, strongly um, advise people not to drive after dusk Okay. and before dawn. Yeah, I remember driving from Cairns on our way to Darwin and <laughs> me and my friend couldn't drive any faster than 20 kilometres an hour and we just gave up. We just went, well, we really can't drive Yeah, you could anymore. nearly walk as fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically from that day I realised that I actually just can't drive at night. So that is a hard thing being down in Tasmania where there isn't so much light and a lot of people have to get to work and they're leaving before it's light and they're coming home when it's dark. So Yeah. So there's, a, a, yeah, in winter there's a lot of roadkill because of that exact thing. Like the commute is right at the same time as, as when all the animals are starting to mobilise. Um, when the weather is really terrible... I think the animals just go, no, forget it, I'm not going to work today and to stay in because I notice there's like immeasurably less roadkill on rubbish nights. How, like after heavy rains and Yeah, during heavy rains and, and if it's windy and yeah. and um, and then in summer, mm. uh, because it's really dry or when it's really dry, yeah. a lot of animals are travelling to get from water to food yeah. and so they become um, hit again. Okay just because there there's more animals movement yeah so um, it is slightly seasonal yeah that this and is... there seems to be more animal movements on the full moon yes okay and the dark of the moon not so many but but that's just a, a kind of a trend it doesn't mean you can just floor it when yeah. it's one you know an off thing because things will jump out or run out yes so i when i first arrived i've in Tasmania, it was one of the first things that I noticed was the amount of roadkill on the roads. Um, and there's been some people that believe that there's actually just so much wildlife here that that's a reason um, as to why we're seeing so much. Um, I don't have an answer, but I don't feel that that's the correct um, yeah. <laughs> train of thought. Yeah, that's right. I agree with you. And there is more wildlife, but that's just because there's um, there's a poverty of uh, like the mainland is impoverished from mm -hmm. wildlife because okay. of lots of reasons. Yes. Yeah. Um, we still have really good remnant populations. I mean, the animals that are generalists, like the paddies and the possums, are doing well because we've made a, a perfect world for them. Okay. So they're breeding up. We've got areas with little pockets of bush and then beautiful pasture. Yeah. Um, but the roads act like a kind of a sink mm. for wildlife. So they'll actually draw in um, animals from around because the animals that be live by the road, and remember just along the road there's these beautiful grassy verges that get extra water so they're extra green because of the runoff from the road. Okay. So the animals will come down and browse along the edges of the road um, and then those will get killed. And then the, the verges are still there. And that, so the next wave of animals will come in. And that just goes on and on and on until sometimes all the animals in the area will be killed. The road into Cradle Mountain, that happened in the 90s. The devils and quolls yep. were just the whole, were being drawn to that roadside. Yeah. Because I guess there were dead wallabies on the road. So the devils came to there and okay. um, they did a lot of work trying to slow the speed down. Yeah. Um, but it was the, the workers from the Cradle Mountain Lodge going home. Okay. That were cleaning up. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And so, and you know, what they didn't mean to, and mm. they tried hard not to, and they made a 60 kilometre speed limit. Yeah. Um, and they identified the areas where the animals were crossing. But, um, yeah, I don't know what that's ha what the long term outcome of that has been. Yeah. Well, when, when I was tracking um, the animals on our drive, what, one thing I did notice was around lots of areas that had a lot of bush um, and a lot of nature, there was a lot more roadkill found. Um, as soon as you're heading into the city, obviously there isn't. 
um, along the freeways and where there's a lot of farming. There was still roadkill, but not as many. Um, we did drive up um, towards Burnie and then head up to Cradle Mountain that way, and I found that there weren't so many animals there, and I was wondering what was going on. And I had seen that there was a lot of plantation there, so I wonder whether their um, nature had been disturbed, so there weren't so many native animals in that area, or what I did see were smaller animals, so I'm not sure what what they were that were on the road, but they were really little, um, so not your paddies and not your roos. And, and then coming back down from Cradle Mountain um, back into Lonnie, that definitely where there's lots of trees and lots of wildlife yeah. and these restricted fences. That's what I also find. There's um, a channel, basically, and they've got nowhere to go. Yes, that's and right. <laughs> and people say, oh, this, you know, when they're driving on the road and they come up to an animal that's on the road, and instead of going, oh, I have to get off the road, the animal will turn and run back down the road in front of the car. Yes. And yeah. that's because they have little places to get off the road like okay. a little driveway for a, a wallaby or a possum or a betong or a quoll yep. they've got their own little spot and they because if if you're an animal you can't just jump yeah into something that you don't know animals yep. have very defined roots okay so they have to get back to their little driveway and if in their fear and they're running they miss that driveway they have to go to the next one okay of their own little exit spots yeah so that's why and that so, can so yeah involved. and so quolls in particular you know if they get spooked mm. sometimes they'll run 200 meters down the road in front of a car and people are going just get off the road get off the road but yep. they can't yeah until they find their little exit spot yeah um so is it better in that moment for us to just stop driving and just let them <laughs> um find their way because otherwise they're constantly in panic yeah i think i think it's good to stop Put yep. your lights down to yep. park lights and just... But then sometimes they go, oh, the problem's over then. They just start pottering around on the road again. <laughs> so you just have to, like, work it out. I, mean, yeah. I get out sometimes and kind of clap my hands and get them off the road. Okay. But you can't do that if somebody's going to come around the corner and smash into the back of your car and run you run you down, you know. But if you're on a straight road in the middle of nowhere, and mm. you can kind of usher them off the road. Yeah. So I've noticed, like... I know um, I've noticed that there's road animal crossings that have been set up around the world. So I did here in New South Wales, um, just outside of Sydney, they've got a, a wire for the ringtail possums. Yeah, all the way up the New South Wales coast. Okay. There's these high wires right across the road from the canopy on both sides. Yep. And that, yeah, that's for ringtail possums. In Europe, they have like underpasses for deer and and things. Um, they they have thought of like putting pipes for animals to go down, but um, carnivores and predators are really canny, you know, and they'll just sit at one end. Okay. And and so the animals learn it's like I'm not I'm not going down there. It's too dangerous. <laughs> It's um, like us with city laneways or something. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, no, no, there's, like, I think there's somebody down there. Yeah. Um, so it's better, like, you, if you want to take wildlife into con into concern in infrastructure design, there's all sorts of ways. Like, instead of building culverts with pipes, they can actually put bridges. Okay. And they're more expensive. Yeah. But then the wildlife has free passage. Yeah. To go under. Yeah. Um, it kind of breaks my heart that they can't accommodate the needs of wildlife but you know if somebody gets killed at the sandfly turn off you know or the um the turn off near kingston yeah. you know they're spending untold untold millions of dollars putting an underpass there so okay. because humans can't seem to get their act together to stop their car and let another car go past yeah wow well. i know yeah so yeah. so we can do that to save a, a human life but yeah there, there's nothing we seem to be able to put money into to save wildlife yeah well that's just what's happening in australia at the moment yes i know yep. up at cradle mountain they did put chicanes in which are those things that make the road skinny okay. so you have to drive around them and that will slow slows cars down okay okay that's so there there is that yeah um and yeah the fences along the side of the road it's a terrible trap for animals because if they get onto the roadside then they can't get off and they are trapped Mm. And I know the New Jersey barriers on the southern outlet, they're those concrete things in the middle. Okay, yes. Then, And if an animal's trying to get across, that's an insurmountable obstacle and then they get panicked and trapped. And Yep. 
I did notice driving to Hobart, there was quite a few. Not usually do I see so many on that freeway, but just the other day I noticed there was quite a few and they were unrecognisable, they were unsavable, they had been very, very squished. Yeah. I um, I used to pull off the road all the animals that I passed. Mm-hmm. It's very time-consuming yes. some days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pull them all off the road, and then the next day I'd come past, and that would be back on the road. Yeah. Oh, really? And I think. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sure I pulled that off the road, and I pull it off the road again. The next day, I'd be back on the road. Wow. And then one day I saw a bunch of ravens. Ah. Oh. Dragging the thing back onto the road. Wow. Because then a car runs over it and it's minced. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because I think if you're a raven, it's kind of hard to break in there. Like you yeah. can get the soft bits, like the eyes and stuff. Yeah. But if a car runs over it. Then it's like, oh, yum. You know, the packaging is off and it's mince. Wow. They're really smart. They're really smart. Wow. That's amazing. Um, So now I don't, if I see ravens are eating something, I don't try and move it off the road. Okay. Yeah. But when I check stuff, I have to put it off the road and then it's up to the ravens to drag it back (laughs) if they want to. Um, But what we need to be aware of is how small the blocks of uninterrupted habitat are Mm. because every single piece of land in Tasmania now Mm. is bounded by some kind of infrastructure okay except for maybe the coastal fringes yeah but like there's everything is surrounded by roads yeah and they do say oh well Tasmania has got all this wildlife but um gradually we're kind of squeezing them into these tiny areas Mm mm-hmm so we need to find a way that we can actually get them to move across the landscape rather than blocking them off. Yes. Because I think it would be really hard for us as humans to not be able to get where we need to go. Like there's a road always built so we can get where we need to go. <laughs> and if there's not, then we go, hey, we can't get there. <laughs> and we get all upset or we might have to ring the council and go, like, can you please put a road in? I don't yeah. know. Like, you know, That's just right. Oh, I have to drive around three sides of a square and I can't face it. I, why can't you yeah. just put a road through? So infrastructure and- has made it so that we can get everywhere we need to go, but we haven't considered the fact that the wildlife needs to get to and travel across. Yes. Okay. We have a mindset as well that, oh, well, we can just cordon off bits that the wildlife can have. Like, we can fence those bits. Yeah. Um, but then we end up with a bunch of isolated bits yeah. that don't really work for the wildlife. Mm. If we could just change our way of thinking and say, all right, it all belongs to the wildlife mm. and we're going to just carve out these tiny bits or these big bits, but whatever it is, we're carving out of that the bits we need to use, rather than saying it's all ours and we'll give the wildlife those little bits and they can have that bit. (laughs) If we we could switch it around and do that kind of gestalt thing in our head and say, no, it's all the the wildlife owns it all and the birds and everything and we're just going to take these bits that we really need to to manufacture the produce that we need to keep ourselves alive and the, the infrastructure that we need to move ourselves around efficiently. Mm. Then, then we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today with wildlife. Yeah, there'd still be animals run over on the road. I'm not saying it would solve the wildlife problem, but it would solve the sort of crushing of the biodiversity wealth that mm. we've got. Mm. Everywhere, anybody you can ask where they live, they will tell you that the things they saw 20 years ago they don't see now. Okay. Yeah, and that's because they've got no movement. Well, it's no... just that everything is being squeezed out. Yeah. And, and even down here, if you ask old farmers, you know, what was it like 50, 100, no, 80 years ago? Mm. It was completely different, you know. Some old guys have said, oh, you, any tussock, you could cook, kick any tussock and something would run out of it. <laughs> well, you can't do that now. No, yeah, and that's happening here and on our seas. It's happening kind of everywhere. So everywhere. Really important for us to do something. Yeah. Yeah. There's a... There's a thing about feeding wildlife. You're not supposed to do it. Okay. But I figure, um, and, I, and I do, I feed my wildlife here a little bit just to keep them here, to stop them going over the hill and becoming a problem for anybody else. And they mow my paddocks and they reduce the fire risk. And whenever I see anybody in the country mowing their lawn, I'm just thinking, you must be nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because these guys will come and do it for you for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and silently. 
<laughs> all the time. And so if you look out there, it's like a bowling green. It's beautiful. I know, isn't it? Yeah. And these and these guys, they work all night. Yeah, they're beautiful. <laughs> um, but sometimes if they're in trouble, they just come. Like there's some kind of wildlife network that says, oh, if you're in trouble, just go there. Okay. They're a sucker. Mm. <laughs> and so um, some not, sometimes... Once I opened the door and there was a possum out there, all burnt. Oh. And I think what from where they'd been clearing up the back, and the okay. possum was just standing there. And I'm pretty sure it was none of mine. Mm. And it was its ears were didn't burn down to little nubs. Wow. And and I said, well, you better come in. And it wouldn't let me touch it or catch it. Mm. But it, it, I gave it a tin of um, oats, rolled yeah. oats. Yeah. And it just ate the oats. And I thought, I don't know how I'm going to get it out. Yeah, and when it was full, I just said, "Look, um, there's the door," and it went, "All right, so yeah," and yeah. went out the door, and it did that every time, every night for months. Okay. Until its fur had all grown back, and its ears had healed up, and all the burnt face had got better. Yeah, so it's like you actually were a hospital for yeah, it. Just for a, it. <laughs> and then it stopped coming when it was fine. Yeah. And um, and then a few years later, I saw it again, mm. and I could tell because it had no ears. Oh. I know, poor little thing, and. And a few years ago, a little potteroo just forced its way in the back door in the winter. Yeah. And it would check out my garbage. Yeah. And um, and then one day it came in. It had a it's a gooey eye and a little sore on its tail. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to let it go out like that. So I closed the doors, and I cornered it in the room and mm. bundled it up in a sheet. And I bathed its eye and I put some salve on its tail. I think it had that got mites. Okay. It was like a kind of a mange starting, so I put some stuff on that, and I thought, well, I'll never see that again. Mm. So I, you know, it's the thing about the shock. Yes. And I thought, so this animal is going to be so shocked because it's a wild adult animal, and I've handled it. It will be gone, and I'll never see it again. But at least I'll know that it hasn't got a gummy eye. And um, and I put it down and opened the door, and it went under the dining room table and folded itself over and had a snooze. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, and I thought, oh, I think it's in a bad way. Anyway, it went out. And I just was started what seeing it around looking really not good. So mm. I gathered it up again and I took it up to the vet. And I thought, well, this is it. This will really do it, the shock of going to the vet. <laughs> and the vets had a look at it and they said, oh, it might have toxoplasmosis. So it's, you know, do whatever you can. Okay. And the toxoplasmosis is from? Cats. Cats. It's okay. a parasite. Yeah. It's, look, this is a whole other story in itself. Yeah. It's a parasite that cats have. Mm. And it's a, it's ecologically, it worked like this. The cats have the parasite and it goes in their shit and the shit is all over the ground. And rats, traditionally, mm-hmm. would eat stuff off the ground and get the parasite. Mm-hmm. And one of the symptoms of the parasite is that the animal's fear is gone. Oh. And, um, oh, talk about stories in stories. Apparently humans get it as well and it makes people sort of promiscuous and coquettish. I don't know, that's what I heard okay. on the radio. But yeah. anyway, it takes away the animal's fear and the rat mm. would sort of swagger out and go, hi, cat, and the cat would eat the rat okay. and get the parasite. And so the parasite cycle wow. cycled like that. So a lot of people ring me and they say, oh, there's a miserable-looking paddy melon in my front yard and it's, and it's hanging around the house. And I, think, and I say, there's nothing much you can do for that. It's got toxoplasmosis and it's probably at the stage now where it's going to die. If mm. you feed it up, give it apples and some food... Sometimes their immune system can get on top of the parasite and beat it back and they'll be all right. Yeah. But anyway, this little guy, I looked online and they treat that toxo in humans Mm -hmm. with a malarial tablet. And just by chance, somebody had given me a bunch of them because um, it's completely illegal to use um, human medicines on wildlife. I mean, well, I don't know if it's illegal to use it, but vets can't give it to you because vets can't prescribe human. But anyway, I had some. And so I dosed up this little guy, and he just moved into the house. Wow. He just hung out in the beanbag. Mm. Ate, beanbag, ate, beanbag. Yeah. And uh, gradually got stronger, and he wasn't bag of bones anymore, and and he really liked it in the beanbag, and he just <laughs> lived there all winter. <laughs> and then in summer, he started going out and coming back and sniffing at the door at night about 11 o'clock, and I'd open the door, he'd come in and waddle into the beanbag and you know, eat some food into the beanbag, and in the morning, he'd just get up and wander out. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he was there for nearly two years, coming wow. and going. And he was a dear little guy. And he was just 
like having a, an old relative, really. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Um, you wouldn't let me touch him. Okay. No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, but if I was sitting in the seat, he would sometimes jump onto my lap. Mm. And uh, he, it was fine if I took a toothbrush and groomed him. That was okay. But I couldn't pick him up. Okay. No, don't touch me. Don't touch me. I'm a wild animal. Yeah. Um, and he, he got over the toxoplasmosis because with the um, malarial yeah. drugs. Yeah, wow. And how long did you have to give him that? Uh, I think it was about two months. Okay, wow. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, but then he, he had a, a malformed jaw, and I think that's why he depended so much on the food in the house. Okay. Because I took him back to the vet. Yeah. And they said, oh, look, his, mouth, his jaw's not right. His mouth doesn't shut properly. He can't chew properly. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, that was really great. And then one day he didn't come back. So I don't know whether he got hit on the road okay, or if an eagle took him away or yep. an owl. I don't know. Yeah. So I, I guess that, that rule of thumb of not feeding animals is actually specific to certain situations. So if an animal's healthy and well, then you don't feed it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But if they're sick and, and needing support, then you help. I think so, yeah. Yeah. That's a good rule. Um, but, like, just by putting out pasture everywhere, we are, we're feeding them. Yeah. I guess, yeah, yeah. And just by people planting roses. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. feeding possums. Yeah, I don't have anything in but my garden. <laughs> I, whenever you do start feeding things, it kind of ends up as a, as a problem because you can end up with too many of the thing and lots of sparring and fighting. and. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's hard not to. Yeah. A lot of people do. Um, what I do feed my babies is uh, pony food. It's okay. like a muesli. I try to get one with no molasses. And how old are they when they're having, like, solid food? Um, from about... Well, as soon as they've got fur... Okay. They start sticking their head out of the pouch. I've learned a lot of what I know about um, caring for wildlife by watching the, the paddy melons out the door, out the window. Yep. And I and I watch them with their little heads sticking out of their mother's pouch, and they clearly they learn to, what to eat by eating when their mum's eating the thing. Their faces are looking at the ground too, so they go, "Oh, that's what we're eating today." You're yeah, great. And um and then they get bigger and they tumble out of the pouch and hop around and um and um and then they're bigger and they keep angling for milk and their mums go nut nah. and they go, "Come on, mum, please, please, no." Nah. Yeah. Please, come on, Mum, just a bit. Please. Nah, all right. <laughs> and she lets them stick their heads in and have a drink. But yep. they're way too big to get in the pouch, but they can still stick their head in and have yep. one teat. And when she does that, she could have another tiny infant on the other teat. Okay. And she's delivering different milk okay. to different babies. Wow. So the tiny baby would get a high-protein, low-fat milk, mm-hmm. and the great big lump outside the pouch would be getting high-fat milk. That's amazing. It's, I know, they're incredible. <laughs> the biology of marsupials is incredible. Yeah. Probably better than us. We <laughs> well, they certainly adapted to this environment so amazingly. Mm. But, yeah, I mean, whenever we, if we had just stayed on the marsupial thing, think of how easy childbirth would be. Yeah. <laughs> Painless. Sometimes when I stop for an animal on the road at night, my heart is just... I'm just praying that there's nothing in it because mm. I just, you just don't want to. Yeah. It's just so hard yep. to do it all the time. Mm. And if you get too many, you can't, it's like it's, stuff goes wrong. Okay. Yeah. And you can't, you just can't manage it. And you can't manage. Mm. And they start, you know, you start uh, letting, letting things slip with hygiene and then the babies get sick. And if one gets sick, they all get sick. And so... Yeah, it's yeah. like you don't want too many. Yeah. So what's a good number for you to be caring for? Two. 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 Okay, is, two little ones. Two little ones is yeah. all I can do. Yeah. But you can have lots on the way out. Yeah, well, that's And I can take other people's. What, mum, like Joey mum would be, I mean, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Patty mum or Patty mum or mum. Possum mum. <laughs> yeah, 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 would be doing anyway because I'd only have one at a time. Yeah, and it's yeah. nice. People around here specialise. So at the moment I'm specialising in paddies. Okay. But I'll take... Um, Bennett's. Yep. And last year I had a little tiny can, um, possum. Yep. But when it got to a certain size, somebody asked me for it because she's a spe- specialist in possums and it's hard to let your babies go, but if it's the best for them. Yes. Yep. 
um, so she's she specialises in possums. She's over near Nichols Rivulet. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Aww. And some people do wombats and stuff, but there's no wombats around here, so I don't do wombats. But I have looked after them for my friends as a okay. as a um, respite care thing. Yep. <laughs> That'd be great. Oh, God. <laughs> but it's really interesting. With the Bennets, a few years ago I had three little Bennets and they all got really big and I thought there'll be an establishment group here and they'll start a little Bennets tribe here and they can, like, muck in with the paddy melons. Mm. And one day I looked up the back and there was this giant male Bennets just standing there, you know, all muscle and front. Yeah. And he just came and he said, come on then. And they all went off with him except for one, the little tiniest oh. one. <laughs> and they just went over the hill. to. I know there is Bennett's over the, over the hill about a kilometre away. So yeah. he's obviously, how he knew, I don't know. But yeah. he just came over. He must have smelt them on the wind or something. Came over. Said, mm. you'll be coming with me then. And they went, ooh, yes. <laughs> ooh, what a big man. And off they went. Except the littlest one who still shows up here sometimes. And that's about three years ago. So wow. if it's a really bad freezing cold morning, mm. she'll come for breakfast with the others. Mm. So the Bennett that you have on at the moment is just staying indoors. He's not. He hasn't yeah, no, popped he's, his head out. He can hardly walk yet. Okay. He can kind of wobble around, but he can't hop. Yeah. But he wouldn't be getting out of the pouch. I mean, he hasn't got any clothes on. Okay. He's yep. still in his singlet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's really quiet. I've only seen him move a couple of times. Yeah. Like... Oh, whoops. He did have a little accident. Um, <laughs> so you need to clean up the poo and we. Um, oh, it's only we really at this stage, isn't it? Oh no, there's plenty. Of poo. Oh, there's plenty of poo. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and with the babies, the worst, the thing you're worried wow. about all the time is um, dehydration. So if they get diarrhea, they get dehydration. So see, so he's just wearing his wow. underclothes. You are. You're so beautiful. <gasps> Look at you. Hello. Sit in the sun a bit. No, really beautiful eyes. Yes, very, very beautiful. Mm. So I can't tell the difference. I don't think I've seen a Bennett before. Okay, they've just got this much longer face. It's more like a deer's face. Yeah. And so are they bigger than a paddy? Much bigger. Wow, okay. Yeah, so he's as big as a paddy that would be well out and hopping around. He's a little bit, I think he's just a little bit dehydrated, so I'm going to give him some more. Some water. So all carers have all sorts of tricks that just stop dehydration and to stop diarrhea and it's like okay. everybody's got their own yep. things. You used to be able to go to the vet and they'd just give you some antibiotics, but they don't do that anymore. Partly because it's it's not that great for them, and partly because they're just clamping down on the okay. administering antibiotics because of antibiotic resistance. Okay, sure. And you're cleaning the bottom. I'm stimulating him so he can do a wee. Okay. Their mums lick him. Okay. In the pouch. Wow. They don't want a pouch full of poo and wee. Okay. Well, they're amazing animals. Yes. And people think they're dumb because they jump out in front of cars. But I think they just see an oncoming car incredibly differently. I mean... They don't kind of get the concept of cars. I mean, they know they see them, but mm. um, in the night time, it's just a really blindingly bright light in front of your eyes. Mm. Um, Blinds us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I can't... Is that oncoming car thing, you always have to look down and... Yeah, and look away. Yeah. I, um, sometimes they jump on the... Somebody said to me that... The car headlights make their shadow behind them move. Okay. And out of, and their eyes are on the side of their head. So when they see that movement, they jump away from it. Okay. Straight into the oncoming car. Okay. Oh, so it's just destined to not be okay. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a theory. I don't know. I don't know how mm. you prove that. I guess you could ask them, but then... <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting to... Tr to um, for a biologist or a, an ecologist to tr to try that as a to work out some way of experimentally mm. working out whether that's true or not. But nobody seems to understand why they jump straight in front of the cars. But it's not because they're stupid. It's because they're disoriented. Yeah, yeah. 
And so would that mean that if we had, have you heard about the car sound? Yeah, I've got those. And things, is that something that works and is it something that, like, you know, we could make a state or an Australian-wide rule or a worldwide rule? To... I don't know. I mean, people who've got them say, oh, you know, we drove around and we didn't hit anything, but I think the people who get them are the kind of people who are going to be careful anyway. Okay, yeah. I don't know. I haven't seen any... Um, research mm -hmm. to say that those work but people who have them say they do okay. but I don't know how you would test like I don't know that anybody has actually tested and driven the same road you know a moment later with without them or with them or yes yeah just minimizing driving at night I reckon is a really good start mm, I have a bit of a prayer as I <laughs> as I set off if I have to drive at night because I really don't like driving at night but if I do I just really ask for the roads to be clear and then the animals to stay off the road, please, because I'm coming through. Yes. I'm really sorry, but I'm coming through. <laughs> and being and concentrating constantly, it's it's necessary, but it's hard. Mm. It's really easy at night for your mind to just drift off. Yeah, and there's a particular part, like I know around our house, like the hill, there's a lot of animals around just the top of our hill. So I always know to slow in those areas, but other areas where you can go faster. Yeah, um, that's right. Maybe if they could somehow work, like make a different road surface for areas that are wildlife mm. um, rich, yep. that would be a start. So people would just gradually get to know that if you see that, just go a bit slower at night. Mm. But they put up signs telling people, yeah, yeah, there's one at Nichols Rivulet now. That yeah, only and there's, happened in the last few years. Yeah, there's one at um, Craddock as well. Okay. But I saw, years ago, I saw some research that said it makes people slow down 10 kilometres an hour for about 200 metres. Okay. And I guess people who really care about wildlife hit less animals. Yes. So if maybe we could just get people to love them and care for them. Mm. And just let that extra one minute in their journey just allow for that, or two minutes, or five minutes, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, to take that time to that take we need. that extra moment. Mm. It's moments. Yeah. To let things survive. Yeah. Yeah, because it's unusual to not see an animal on the road at night as we drive. Yep. Like, that's an unusual thing. But if you live somewhere, you know where yeah. the, the crossing areas are and the high density areas are. Yeah. All right, let's get your bag. Oh, so cute. So beautiful. Yeah. Look, all, all marsupials have this. Look at this, the inside toe. It's, it's got a grooming claw. Aww. It's like a tiny comb. Yeah. It's for doing your fur. So he's more blue as well. Yeah. Gray. They're much more grey than yeah. paddies that are brown. Yeah. <laughs> all right, little man. Um... Let's get him a little bag. All right, I think that's just about everything I can tell you. Oh, thank you so much. That's just, a pleasure. Yeah, and I learnt heaps as well. Like, there's <laughs> so much that I've learnt. <laughs> and now I just need to be brave enough to be able to handle an animal. Oh, no, I can handle one right now. That's, <laughs> that's okay, one that's alive. Aww. No. <laughs> See you, little guy. Yeah. Like, what's the little noise? Is that his little mouth? Or? Oh, he's teething. Okay. Yo, that's too cute. Well, where are you going? Oh, they're just adorable. <laughs> they are adorable. You can't not become completely besotted with them and yeah. parental about them. Yeah. <laughs> so is it hard to let them go or you can't no. get sad? You can't, I mean, are you, no. It's no. actually, you feel great that they're going to get out there and cut it. And some of them maybe don't make it. Mm. But then apparently one in six baby possums gets taken by a predator anyway. Okay. Yeah. And I notice a lot of the wallabies come around here, particularly their first baby. Mm. 
the, the young girls, I think, oh, you're too young to have a baby, and they have a shot at it. And then one day they show up, and I go, where's your baby? And they go, mm. Oh, that was just too young. Too That's young, like, oh. and maybe not enough, kind of not good enough at milk, or the baby wasn't quite right, or... Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, do you want to go back to mum? There was a little wallaby I've had here for um, five or six years. Yeah. And when I, when I was, we found her out there lying on the ground as a baby, mm. just dumped. And um, some people were staying here while I was away and they said, oh yeah, we found her, we brought her in and fed her up and, and then she was just a tiny little weak mm. thing and she couldn't hop properly and she had funny little back feet. Yeah. And, ple- and obviously her mum had gone, oh, she's not, that's not right. Mm. And had dumped her because there's no point putting energy and effort into a, a thing that's probably not viable. And she wouldn't have been viable if we hadn't brought her in. Fed her. Wow. Okay. She would have just died out there of exposure. Wow. And but then was like, she okay? Did she grow up okay? She grew up not okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she never could hop properly. Um, and she had babies. But the babies were all a bit weird. One of them didn't have enough fingers and okay. she lost her first baby. Mm. Um, so she struggled. She struggled. She had one fine baby who grew up fine mm. and the next baby didn't, disappeared. She okay. was old then so I guess, mm. I don't know. And she started coming in the house to eat Okay. and then she started coming in to sleep. Okay. She was obviously getting old and really frail. Yeah. And um, she took up to the beanbag as well. Things love the beanbag. Yeah. And going out in the daytime, coming in at night and getting in the beanbag. Some days just staying, no, I can't get up. I'm staying in the beanbag. Mm. And then last, about two weeks ago, I just realised I hadn't seen her for a few days and I haven't seen her. So yeah. she's gone. Okay. Yeah. Funny little thing. She yeah. was really tiny. She never grew to adult size. Okay. She was always kind of a bit scraggy looking and funny little back feet, couldn't hop. And the others all kind of made her at the bottom of the pecking order. Yeah. <laughs> but she used to just come in the house for herself. Yeah. <laughs> How old is she when she... Um, she must have been six-ish. Okay. I think that's a fair thing for a patty melon. Mm. In the wild. Yeah, she's done really well. Yeah. Well, mm. being out in the wild, I think it's tough. It would be, yeah, yeah. It is the fittest and the strongest survives. That's just the rule of. Yes, that's made them into a bunch of toughies. Yeah. And they can, some mornings it's so cold and they just go, yeah, whatever. Yeah, and that's changed for us because we've got our creature comforts and. Yeah, we've got clo- clothes. Yeah, we do have clothes <laughs> and we've got fires. Fires, <laughs> yeah. Houses. But that's not to say that animals don't appreciate that that those creature comforts. Yeah, yeah. creature comforts. When I get up in the morning, all the ones that are in bed, they all get up too. And I put the heater on because I'm wet. I put the heater on to get dressed in front of the heater. Yep. I don't like the fire. I just put this little heater on. And and then I have to fight my way to the heater because everybody gets out of bed and rushes in front of the heater. And there's this big mob of people in front of the heater. <laughs> they oh, get so it. great. They don't not get it. Yeah. They like the food. They, they like the heat. The, yeah. They like the bed. They love the bed. <laughs> and they like the cuddles. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when they get hot, they get out. And when, yep. then when they get cold, they come in. Yeah. <laughs> no. So what do they do in the wild? Like, are they... Well, they'd be with their mums. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <coughs> and they'd have their little nests and they'd be mm-hmm. kind of cuddled together. Yeah. There's a lot of cuddling. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, and possums the same, you know, they take their babies into their little... Hollows or wherever. Mm. Rooftop. Mm. Roof cavity. Yeah. <laughs> I've got one in the bathroom wall. <laughs> when you're having a shower, you can hear it in there scratching. <laughs> Not great. Oh, your world is amazing, Susie. My world is so beautiful. Yeah. I just feel so sorry for people who aren't delighted by animals. Mm. Because... I just think their life must be somewhat impoverished. Yeah. 
but if you don't know about something, then you don't kind of miss it. You don't think, oh, if only I had, like, wild animals that wanted my company. Yeah, I find, like, I've had a hard week this week and not been feeling so well or just maybe the world's just a bit, bit too much, been a bit too busy or something. So I've been quite down and in those moments of being really down, I will just look up and I've had these really amazing interactions with birds, like just, like, ones that w- walked out and there he is singing on my deck. And I was like, oh, so cute and like there's this loss of connection that I'm having all the time with all the stresses that I'm having but as soon as I get down all I do is look outside and there they are (laughs) cheering my cheering me up and I don't even didn't ask for it didn't just they're just there and they just make me go oh that's right (laughs) you guys always continually be amazing (laughs) you're always doing your thing you're always really happy (laughs) yeah imagine not having that to go to (laughs) no wonder so many people you know are sad Mm. yeah but at school no matter how like antsy the kids are Mm. if they take them into the bush yes they just open up like flowers. Yeah. And I mean, you keep hearing every time you turn the radio on now, they say, oh, if you go in the forest, there's bacteria there that affect you and make your brain happy. Oh, yes, yeah, they were, do- they were doing research or studies in China or something and they're all doing walks and, yeah, there's this walking thing that's happening of going out and connecting with nature. And, yeah, yeah, there's something to be said about that more and more. I'd say, yes. Mm, yeah, I grew up in the city, so... I had a connection with nature just because of the area we backed on was had been cornered off a road and the road did get built but 25 years later or oh. something. Where? Where were um, you? West Pennant Hill, so it was the M2 that got put in and I remember being 16 and getting so upset because I've been reforesting in the bush um, for a couple of years and I remember writing a poem to the... Um, to the council to just say, like, you know, please save my forest. This is a place where I have grown up and I've connected and I've played since I was a little kid in this bush. And I remember them coming through and talking to us about how there's going to be a bridge and we're going to be, the animals will be able to get across and we'll be able to get across. But that was a bridge for the road. (laughs) And then everything else got filled in underneath. And then, yeah, at a certain point, then they were able to actually make the, um, the highway go above the forest so there is an area where they can cross and stuff oh, but great. I couldn't no longer get to school or the local shop through the bush like oh, yeah. oh god <laughs> yeah. and it's so busy now and it's so smoggy like my mum and dad's house is just constantly getting smog like they have like white trim around their house and it's just it's gray covered in black and yeah it's oh. interesting and it's really noisy now but um yeah, it's an interesting thing. Mm. Yeah, it's sad. So, but old people say, oh, this was a creek once, and you look and it's like, you mean that culvert? <laughs> and they go, yeah, we used to play here when we were kids. It was a beautiful creek. We'd go fishing here, and now it's... Yeah, yeah, but I'm happy that I had that connection because I did live in a city, and I didn't really... A lot of people don't really get that opportunity. So yeah. for me to have had a connection, I love the land for what it is and have all those childhood memories makes me want to love our land and look after it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with urbanisation, more and more people. Mm. So where they live now is kind of in a city, almost. Like, it takes 20 minutes to get in from a bus now on this M2, and there's so many people that live further out and beyond where once upon a time that was the edge and it was all farmland. Yeah. Going out to Jewel and beyond. So yeah, it's, oh, God. Yeah, it's amazing just in my lifetime that it's... Yeah. Doubled and... But when we were kids, I'm a lot older than you, but <laughs> you might even remember when, like when I was a kid, in the afternoons we'd watch telly and mm. all the shows were about a child and an animal. Okay. All the shows, there was Rin Tin Tin and Lassie and The Littlest Hobo and um, Flipper and Elephant Boy and yeah. mm, everything, everything was about a kid and an animal. Mm. But that's not what kids watch now. No, there's a lot of death and destruction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't quite worked out if that's... But, and I guess kids don't kind of identify with kids who hang out with animals anymore. Mm. I mean, around here they do. Around here they do, But in yeah. cities, no. You know, it's like if you live in a 13th floor apartment, 
Mm. You're probably not even going to have a dog mm. or a cat. Oh, well, thank you, Susie. Oh, that's lovely, Amanda. It's thank you. It's been so great to hear everything and your experience of... I can see that you love your animals and the connection with them is just amazing. And I think you're doing such a great job. Thank you. I yeah. wish I didn't have to do that.